Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial. We invite you to follow us on Twitter at MacArthur1880 or find the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial on Facebook. This podcast was sponsored by the Ernst and Gertrude Tico Charitable Foundation. In early October 1918, several companies of the U.S. 77th Division found themselves surrounded in the Argonne Forest during the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Led by Major Charles Whittlesey, the Lost Battalion, as it came to be known, survived a hellish six days. It's a story many are aware of, but like most such stories, it's likely that the popular version we are most familiar with doesn't have the richness or the nuance of what actually happened. To walk us through the story of the Lost Battalion, today we are joined by Robert J. Laplander, author of Finding the Lost Battalion, Beyond the Rumors, Myths, and Legend of America's World War I Epic. Welcome, sir, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and a great honor. So before we get started, let's just get a few things settled. When we talk about the Lost Battalion, what exact units are we actually talking about? And can you explain why we use the word lost to identify them? The Lost Battalion was a composite unit of uh, elements of companies A, B, C, E, G, and H of the 308th Infantry, Company K from the 307th Infantry, and elements of Company C and D of the 306th Machine Gun Battalion. There were a few medical men in there. There were three men from the 305th Field Artillery who were on a shoot location mission. And there was a sprinkling of others from some of the other units. You have to remember that at, by that time, we'd been in fighting in the Argonne Forest for over a week, and things were pretty messed up. There had been a lot of casualties. The forest is incredibly dense. So there was a lot of dispersion of units, a lot of casualties. And men were being folded into just about any unit that was available at the time. When Major Charles Whittlesey walked over the back side of Hill 198 into the Charlevoix Ravine, where they were would be surrounded, he had about 689 men with him that we've been able to actually prove. There's never been a definitive list. So for the almost 25 years that I've been working with the Lost Battalion, we've constantly refined the list trying to decide who really was there. And right now, the list stands at about 689. When we use the word lost, it didn't mean that nobody knew where they were. Everyone knew where they were. Most most units that were involved with this had a general idea that they were in the Charlevoix Ravine. Nobody knew exactly where in that section of ravine, whether they were on the bottom or dug into the side of the hill or what. Um, lost meant that their situation was pretty much hopeless. It was coined, it was a term that was coined by a newspaper man. Uh, one of the reporters that was there fished the story back to his editor in the States, and his editor thought that it was a, it was a good story, but it, it needed something for pizzazz for the papers. So he sent back one short message that said, send more on lost battalion. They weren't a battalion. They were actually elements of several different battalions. They weren't even full battalion strength, and they certainly weren't lost. Even the guys that were there would say, well, we weren't lost. The Germans knew where we were the whole time. So lost was in reference to the fact that nobody thought that they would get out. So tell us about Charles Whittlesey from his Plattsburgh experience to what he's doing right before the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Charles Whittlesey um, is a very interesting character. He's got a lot of layers to him, a lot of differences. He was actually born in Florence, Wisconsin, a very, very small town in northern Wisconsin, about 14 miles from the upper peninsula border, the upper peninsula Michigan border. When he was 13, his family moved back out east to uh, Massachusetts. His father was actually from Vermont. Um, his mother had been born in New York, but raised in Michigan. All of the children were born in Wisconsin. He had several brothers and one sister, and the sister died here. He grew up in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. He went to high school high school there. Then he went to Williams College, and then from there he went to Harvard Law. He became a lawyer, opened up his own practice in New York City. He was a very, very popular individual, a very dry sense of humor. He was very tall. He was six foot three. Most of it was legs. He looked like a school teacher. 
Um, he didn't look like a soldier, and he never wanted to be a soldier. Um, although he did mention when he graduated from college that his f- fondest wish was he wanted to do something that he didn't want to do uh, because he felt that that would make him a better individual. He was a very, very academic, very high-minded individual. When the war threatened and the Plattsburgh program came into being, following the 1915 Plattsburgh camp, uh, the graduates were sent home with a challenge. Find two or three of your buddies and challenge them to come next year. So the 1916 camp was very large, and Charles was one of those who had been challenged to come, and he decided, this is something I don't want to do, so I'm going to do it. And he went, and he they found out that he was actually a very good soldier. What made him a very good soldier is that he had an intense attention to detail. So when they uh, when the war broke out and they recalled them all in 1917 for the actual camp that was going to be you know, make them the first of the 90 day wonders, he was actually made a captain right away when they graduated him. But they also realized that he was not a combat commander; uh, he was a paper pusher. So they put him in charge of the headquarters company the new 308th Infantry, which was part of the 77th Division. The 77th Division was part of the Draft Army. It was the 2nd Division raised, uh, based in New York City. So they put him in charge of the headquarters company, where they figured he would do very much good for the cause and cause very little difficulties once they got us across into combat. When in the first battles, he formed his duties very well. And they found that it was hard to keep him away from the front. He wanted to be up at the front with his with his buddies. He wanted to help out. He wanted to do this. Um, he didn't believe in war. He was a socialist by nature. By the time he got into the army, his a lot of his socialist tendencies had kind of worn away a little bit. The war would change that, and he would come home more dyed in the wool socialist than ever. But uh, he he performed his duties well and decided that if we're going to do this. I want to do it to the nth degree, and then let's get out of here. So he was determined to, to give everything he could. By the time they got done in the summer of 18, in the Vell sector near Chateau Terry, a lot of the officers had been killed or wounded. So before, just before they went into the, the Argonne Forest, he was put in charge of the 1st Battalion of the 308th Infantry. This is about 1,200 men that he would have charge of, four companies worth of men. And... He was not combat commander, so he was not really suited for the job. He got the job because one of the machine gun officers in the 307th had told the division commander, he's the only one who can ever tell me what's going on over there. So he got the job because of that and because he was eager to get it done, and he was next in line. And when they got to the Argonne Force, they found out that the 1st Battalion of the 308th was going to lead the 308th Infantry into combat. So here we're going to go into the largest battle that America's ever fought. And the guy who's going to lead this regiment in doesn't really have combat experience. What he does have is a good head on his shoulders and a determination to get things done. Uh, the biggest problem that he faced at the beginning outside of his inexperience was the fact that on the Vell, he had been gassed. And he'd been gassed pretty severely. And he had not gone back to seek medical treatment for it because he knew they'd take him off the line and he didn't want that to happen. So uh, when he went over the top that morning of September 26th, he could barely talk above a whisper. He had a racking cough and he was sick as a dog, but he still managed to lead his men into the forest. The next six or seven days were an absolute nightmare. We were not prepared. The 77th was not prepared for what they were going to face in that forest. Now, they weren't supposed to take the forest in force to begin with. The French were going to go up one side of the forest, and the 28th Division would move up the opposite side of the forest, and they would meet above and pinch it off, while the 77th kept steady and even pressure from the bottom on what would believe to be a retreating enemy. If the enemy didn't retreat, they would be cut off themselves. But the Germans had been there for four years, and that forest inside was set up like a city. There's trenches all over the place, machine gun positions everywhere. It's a pre-sighted artillery target. They knew everything about it. And the forest itself, for centuries, armies have fought around it because it's so thick and tangled. And what, when the 77th moved in, they fractured. The division just com- came apart. The first phase of the Meuse-Argonne offensive was supposed to take 72 hours. It took them 14 days. They did not have enough medical set up for it. They did not have enough food, water, 
Everything had to be hand carried up. Whittlesey's units, he was gathering in men as he could, folding things together, and he was meeting his objectives. Uh, they were a very, very determined lot, those boys, and they pushed forward, hit every objective that they were supposed to. And on the morning of October 2nd, 1918, they were supposed to push up the main ravine that ran north and south through the middle of the Argonne Forest and meet up at the Charlevoix Ravine, which ran east and west, and it teed off right there. On the opposite side of the Charlevoix Ravine was a road and a railroad, and that was actually their objective. Far off to the left, about 800 or 900 meters to the left of where they were supposed to cross, was the Charlevoix Mill. And it was there that they were supposed to meet the French. The French were supposed to come up on their left. There was a hill on their left that was dividing the two armies. So they were going to go around it. Whittlesey tried in the morning, get his men over Hill 198, which was on the left, and they failed. And in the afternoon, his, his division commander sent word down that you will advance and you will take your objective without regard to flanks losses. And Whittlesey did just that. They found an open door, pushed across the top of the hill, crossed the ravine. And rather than dig in on, on the, the roadbed itself, where they would be open to shell fire, they dug into the side of the hill facing the Germans. So they were on the north side of the ravine, and this would protect them from shell fire. That night, the Germans found a hole that they had punched through the line, closed it, and they were ringed in. By the next morning, they were ringed in. Um, it, hadn't, it, it wasn't the first time. It had happened three days before on a small, smaller hill behind them. The Germans had cut them off for about 72 hours. And it had been a real close call back there. They were a much smaller force. They took a lot of casualties. And Whittlesey had told his commander when he got the orders to advance across the Charlevoix, if we do this, there's a very good chance we're not going to come back. It'll be the same thing again. And he was told, you will proceed with these orders. And as a matter of fact, on the afternoon of October 2nd, um, he had a very acrimonious telephone conversation from the front with his regimental commander. And he told him, he said, this is not a good idea. If we go over there, we're going to get surrounded. It's an untenable position. And his commander said, you're just getting panicky. Um, you need to proceed with your orders. And Little C said, all right, I'll attack. Whether you'll hear from me again or not, I don't know. And he dropped the phone. And that was the last anybody heard of him for the next five days. When they got into the position, they realized that the only way that they were going to be able to communicate was via uh, carrier pigeon. And that's what they did for the first three days they were in there. And then they ran out of pigeons. And that was that. Can you walk us through what those days were like? They started taking fire from trench mortar positions almost immediately and machine gun fire. The Germans knew they were there. The Germans watched them walk into that ravine. Uh, it's very wooded. So they dug in deep, realizing that if they could be seen from the air, by the airplanes when they came over, or they could be seen from across the ravine, they would be seen by the Germans. So they dug in deep, and the Germans opened up with two heavy trench mortars ahead of them and one behind them. And it was the one behind them that did most of the damage. Uh, they also ringed them with machine gun fire. Now there was a creek running down at the bottom of the ravine close to the foot of the hill, the Charlevoix Brook. It was the only source of water, and the Germans knew it. So anytime they saw the rush grass move next to the creek, they just opened up with a machine gun. The fire was almost continuous for the first 24 hours. As a matter of fact, in the first 48 hours that they were in that ravine, they lost 62% casualties of the unit in the first 48 hours. It was horrible. And these guys, they were out of food. They were out of medical supplies by noon of the first day. You know, Little C had set up a, a medical area down near the foot of the hill, they dug a, a trench, a low trench, where they were putting the the, uh, the wounded in. And then the dead, instead of being buried right away, because they didn't, you know, they thought they were going to be out of there in a day or two, they started stacking the dead in front of the wounded to protect them from fire from across the ravine. And then the Germans started launching headlong attacks. And the headlong attacks uh, first came from the flanks and then from across the bottom. And then they would come down on the road above them, stand on the road and throw hand grenades down the hillside. The hillside is very steep. Uh, it's about a 60 degree grade. And uh, 
if you're standing on the on that roadway looking down at a hill, you can see everything. Um, the the Doughboys had set up a perimeter that was about 300 meters long by about 100 meters wide. It was an, an ellipsis. They put their machine guns. They had nine machine guns. They put um, all but two on the left flank, which was more open. The other two went over to the right flank. On the morning of the third, one unit from the 3rd Battalion of the 307th managed to break through to them, and that was Company K. And it was commanded by a fellow by the name of Nelson Holderman. He was a National Guard officer from California, and he was a hell of a soldier. He, he just loved being a soldier. This would be the only real combat that he would see. And by the end of the event, he had taken seven separate wounds. And he was using two broken rifles to hold himself up. And he was still at the head of his company on the firing line. And for those reasons, among others, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. By the uh, third day that they had been in there, they were running out of energy to bury the dead. They were just throwing them back in their holes and covering them up as best as they could. They were going through the pockets of the dead Germans around them trying to find food. Ammunition was running very low. Uh, Willis, he only had two birds left. He had sent out, please, you know, look, you got to you got to get to us. I, we're really beginning to, to have a hard time here. Behind them, the rest of the 308th and 307th knew what was happening, and they were working desperately trying to get through to them. And it wasn't so much just to break through to them, but it was to break the line because the line had sealed itself behind him. Everywhere else on, on the line in the Meuse-Argonne for the, for the 22 kilometers that that line ran, everywhere else that first line had been broken, but not in the Argonne Forest. The Germans were holding out in the Argonne Forest. And they, in truth be told, had they had the, the, the proper uh, support at the time, they could have held out there forever. The 77th ended up expending almost as many men trying to get through to Whittlesey as Whittlesey lost in there. So it it was almost a battle of attrition. And the Germans had him surrounded with almost an equal amount of men that he had. But the Germans had every upper hand. They were on the high ground. They had unlimited supply of ammunition for their weapons. They knew the area well. Meanwhile, our guys were, were battling against them, against tremendous odds. The only thing that, that really, I think, saved them was the fact that the Germans weren't using a lot of gas because in, in that portion of the forest, it doesn't disperse. There's not a lot of wind. The, the forest is so thick in some spots that you can only see about 10 or 12 feet. In, in the summertime when the trees leaf out, there's areas in the forest where the sunlight never touches the ground for months. It's very, very primeval, very jungle-like. And our guys really had a hard time in there. Whittlesey had these three artillerymen in with him, and they decided that they were going to try to do something about the uh, trench mortars that were coming in. So Whittlesey had to ask the one officer there, a fellow by the name of John Teekmuller, if he could contact his battery and try to get some counterfire. Teekmuller had, he was in just as bad a shape as everybody else, you know, sleepless, hungry, cold, wet, tired, sick. And he wrote out a message and sent it out on one of the birds. And he inadvertently transposed two numbers in the coordinates where they were. And when that when his battery fired on those coordinates, it fell far behind them, right on the main line, and it ended up killing a couple of our guys. When the battery realized what they had done, what had happened, they reversed those coordinates, and they were going to fire in, in front of Whittlesey to keep the Germans, what they said, to keep the Germans off his back. They would fire a shoot, a line in front of him, and then they would drop a line behind him on the German trenches behind him. And that would give him a chance to gather his forces and fight their way out. And this is on, on the uh, afternoon of October 4th that the fire started to come in. And that's when they really lived their worst day because that line of fire that came in, that was supposed to come in ahead of them, actually came in down on top of them. Um, and this is where, this is where Cherami comes in. This is where the pigeon comes in. So probably everybody's, everybody's favorite part of the story. Right. And I was going to say, we have a mutual friend, uh, Dr. Frank Blazich, who's done some pretty amazing work on Cherami. But tell us about the role of this pigeon. The story of Cherami is is interesting because, look, people love heroes. And people love, they, they love animal heroes more than anything. 
And everybody likes to think that Jeremy was so brave and saved these guys and stuff. Jeremy did what Jeremy was trained to do, and that's fly where the food was. So, and there has always been some debate as to whether the bird that is actually on display at the Smithsonian is the correct bird. And that's where that's where Frank came in to play Dr. Blazich. Um, he and I know each other well. We were in France together last year, and I walked him around the area so he could see where it actually all happened. And we've discussed this ad nauseum. There's a lot that we agree on, a couple of things we don't, um, and it's, it's, it's an interesting and lively debate. The basic story is, you see, nobody knew that these birds had names. Now, if you watch the 2001 movie, they, they show Omar Richards, the character. He was actually a real man. He was from, uh, he was French Canadian from Northern New York. Uh, they show him petting the bird and, you know, calling him Jeremy. It'll be okay, Jeremy. It was just another bird. They didn't, they weren't pets. They were issued a crate of birds and that's all they were. When they got down into there, into the hole in, in, uh, in the Charlevoix, the artillery fire was coming in and the second in command, George McMurtry, ran across Whittlesey and he told him, he says, it's our own. And he said, I know, and we're going to do something about that. So he ran over and grabbed Richards and he sat down and wrote a message that said, we are along the road parallel 276.4. Our own artillery is dropping a barrage directly on us. For heaven's sake, stop it. And he gave the message to Richards and he said, you need to get this out right away. It's our only chance. Richards folded it up and he put it in the little aluminum tube. And he reached into his into his hoop. He had two pigeons left. And he brought one out. And just as he did, a shell landed real close. And he lost his grip on the bird. And the bird took off. So the last bird that they had, he brought out. And he clipped the message on. And he tossed the bird in the air. And the bird landed in a tree. He's not stupid. He's not flying around when there's all that junk flying through the air. And he's terrified. So he landed in a tree. Whittlesey turned to him and he said, isn't there something you can do? So they started throwing sticks and rocks up at this bird. And the bird just hopped up to a higher branch. And Richards realized that something really needed to be done. So under fire, he jumped up. He ran down the hillside and started to climb the tree. And he was shaking the tree. And he finally got the bird to fly off. And one of the other men saw as the bird flew down the ravine, a shell went off and the bird hit the ground. Um, only one or two of them saw the bird get back up and take off. And about 23 or 24 minutes later, the bird landed at the mobile loft that he was based at. And they got the message. And it's supposed to be that that's where they found out what was happening. And they lifted their shell fire and the bird saved the unit and all that. Truth of the matter was, is they had already already figured out what was going on through other means. And the shell fire was already starting to lift as the bird was landing. But the difference was just a couple of minutes. And in the public's mind, that's a better story. And nobody knew that this other officer had realized what was happening farther behind the lines. Nobody knew that. So, And nobody would know that until uh, the 1930s, until somebody realized what had happened. So in the public's mind, this bird saved them. The bird has a name, Jeremy, and he's a hero. It's one of my favorite parts of the story because it, it truly is a climax. Whether you, the bird had a name or not is not the point. The point is, is that they were doing everything that they could. And you could not tell any one of those guys that had been in that ravine that that bird did not save them. They were all convinced that that bird saved them. And it's, it's a beautiful part of the story. And you can go to the Smithsonian and visit Jeremy. Jeremy came home after the war and died in June of 1919 and was immediately stuffed and put on display and has been on display in the museum ever since. It's the only World War I artifact that never went off display. And the only time that the bird has ever left the Smithsonian was just a couple of months ago. In November, the bird went to New York and Frank and I were uh, very pleased to be able to show the bird on stage at Carnegie Hall. And uh, that was, it was quite a treat. I'm sure. That was part one of the conversation about the Lost Battalion with Robert Laplander. Part two will be available soon and will cover the attempts by the 50th Aero Squadron to aid the Lost Battalion, the eventual relief of the Lost Battalion, an analysis of Whittlesey's leadership, and some thoughts on Whittlesey's tragic suicide and the ultimate legacy of the Lost Battalion.
Thank you for listening. If you have questions, suggestions, or comments, we want to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter at MacArthur1880, on Facebook as the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial, or you can email MacArthurMemorial at Norfolk.gov.